Hi everyone, my name is David Kastner and I'm a graduate student in the Kulik Lab at MIT and I'm looking forward to sharing my recent work on non-heme iron enzymes and specifically on hydroxylases and halogenases. In the project that I'm presenting today, I'll share how we are working to uncover trends in substrate positioning that differentiate these two closely related classes of enzymes. Now, as foreshadowing for the rest of my talk, on my cover slide here, I'm depicting a stylized representation of a hydroxylase, specifically the hydroxylase tau D. On the active site, I want to point out that I visualized one feature in particular that I'm interested in, the angle between the reactive oxygen species, the metal center, and the target hydrogen that is abstracted by this non-heme iron hydroxylase during its native reaction. We believe that it's an important feature that differentiates halogenases and hydroxylases. And throughout this talk, I'll share with you some of our findings that led us to this conclusion. Now, before we talk more about the distinguishing features, I wanted to provide some background as to why it's essential to study non-heme iron enzymes in the first place. For example, non-heme iron enzymes are found across all domains of life meaning that what we learn from studying a given non-heme iron enzyme can be translated to research and applications in another species. Second, non-heme iron enzymes are already used in a number of key industrial processes. For example, the hydroxylase VOC is used in the biosynthesis of a potent antibacterial drug called vancomycin, and the hydroxylase 4-HIP is used in the synthesis of hydroxyprolines, which are used in the food and cosmetic industries. Now, even more importantly, non-heme iron enzymes are implicated in a number of diseases. For example, Ag AGLN is implicated in cancer, and the disease states of CDO and ETH1 can lead to neurological problems. However, in addition to these broader reasons for studying non-heme iron enzymes, we can also gain chemical insights by studying their active sites. For example, non-heme iron enzymes as a class can bind an impressive range of substrates through a finely tuned coordination of non-covalent interactions, which can, which can teach us a lot about substrate positioning and substrate specificity. Additionally, non-heme iron enzymes can carry out a very impressive range of reactions that include halogenations, hydroxylations, desaturations, epoxidation, ring closures, and even isonitrile formation. Now, to highlight the differences between halogenases and hydroxylases, let's take a closer look at the active sites starting with tau D which is one of the best studied non-heme iron hydroxylases. Here I've highlighted the active site of tau D, which I feel is representative of the typical active site observed for hydroxylases. You can see here that there are two histidines and either an aspartate or glutamate coordinating the iron center. In the reactive state, there's also this reactive oxo that coordinates the iron center and can react with the target hydrogen. Now the halogenases, on the other hand, look very similar with the exception that this aspartate or glutamate is mutated to a glycine or alanine to make room for a chlorine atom. Now here I'm showing the active site of a typical halogenase. You can see that a chlorine atom now occupies the binding site where the aspartate was. This allows for chlorination instead of hydroxylation of the activated carbon atom. I also wanted to note that in this slide I'm showing the coordinating residues of the halogenase SIRB2, which was the first non-heme iron halogenase discovered. However, there are many other examples of non-heme iron enzymes that I could have selected, and in later slides I will cover a few of them, such as BESD and WELO5, which are also halogenases like SIRB2. Now that I've given you a high-level overview of halogenases and hydroxylases, I want to talk more about their unique chemistry. Here, similar to the previous slide, I'm illustrating the active site of the hydroxylase tau D, except I'm now also showing the position of the substrate relative to the iron center, with this specific hydrogen being the target hydrogen that would be abstracted by the oxo. To illustrate this reaction, I've computed the reaction profile for tau D at a quantum mechanical level of theory, which I think is helpful in illustrating the reaction. Here you can see the oxo reacting with the hydrogen to form the iron hydroxyl, and then homolytically recombining with the substrate to hydroxylate it. Now interestingly, this reaction mechanism is almost identical across all hydroxylases and acts on a diverse range of substrates. For example, 
Mutations in HIF1-alpha, which hydroxylates proline, are strongly correlated to several of the most aggressive cancers, including pancreatic cancer. Mutations in CDO, which hydroxylates cysteine, have been linked to neural toxicity in diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. VOC, which hydroxylates arginine, is used in the synthesis of vancomycin and is used to fight life-threatening bacterial infections. And lastly, SCOE, another enzyme I personally worked on, uses a hydroxylation reaction to trigger nitrile formation, which is often described as a molecular warhead. Okay, now imagine that you wanted to halogenate all these substrates. What would you do since they are normally hydroxylated? In other words, how would you go about tuning a hydroxylase like tau D into a halogenase? Well, the most obvious difference between a hydroxylase and a halogenase is the loss of the aspartate bonded to the metal. So you might start by mutating the aspartate to an alanine. And then we would expect to see a halogenated substrate instead of a hydroxylated substrate. Well, interestingly, this doesn't work most of the time and simply breaks the enzyme. In fact, early studies had the same hypothesis and went around systematically making these mutations and kept ending up with barely functional hydroxylases. So we now know that there must be more factors that are important to distinguishing halogenases and hydroxylases. And if we can identify those factors and learn to manipulate them, then we would be able to halogenate all the substrates that are normally hydroxylated. So what are the factors? Well, a good place to start is asking nature how it does it with halogenases. Now, there's really no better place to start when discussing the distinguishing factors between halogenases and hydroxylases than with the first discovered non-heme iron halogenase, SIRB2, which has evolved a fascinating mechanism for favoring halogenation over the more accessible hydroxylation reaction by using a second helper protein or carrier protein called SIRB1. In SIRB1, the substrate threonine is attached to a prosthetic arm and physically held in the active site to get the perfect substrate positioning angle. What's even more interesting is that studies have shown that by changing the substrate, SIRB2 can be switched from a halogenase to a hydroxylase. But the question is, what could be causing this? Well, in the same study, they also noticed that the angle between the oxo, the metal, and the hydrogen became more acute whenever SIRB2 was favoring hydroxylation and that the distance between iron and the target hydrogen also got smaller, which suggests that halogenases can favor hydroxylation by either getting closer to the iron or adjusting the angle between the oxo, the iron center, and the target hydrogen. Now, if we zoom in on the active site of SIRB2, this is what the angle looks like. And if we zoom in on the active site of tau D, this is what the angle looks like. You can see that the SIRB2 angle looks notably more obtuse than the angle in tau D. We next wanted to see if this difference was also observable across other crystal structures and NMR measurements, which we did by looking at the literature. And we found that there did seem to be a trend among hydroxylases and halogenases, and you can see it here in this plot. You can read this plot as on the x-axis we have the distance between the iron center and the hydrogen target. And on the y-axis, we have the angle that forms between the hydrogen target, the iron center, and the reactive oxo. And what you will see is that the halogenase measurements all group together with more obtuse angles, and the hydroxylase measurements all group together with more acute angles. However, what you will also notice is that the distance between the iron and the target hydrogen shown on the x-axis does not do a good job of distinguishing the two groups. Now, you'll also notice that there just aren't very many points here. That's because it is very challenging to experimentally isolate the reactive state of halogenases and hydroxylases with the oxo, which is required to get these measurements. However, this makes a great question to answer with computational methods. So next, we set out to use classical molecular dynamics and quantum mechanical calculations to probe this phenomenon. To Better understand the differences in substrate positioning between halogenases and hydroxylases, we use classical molecular dynamics to force hydroxylases to sample obtuse angles and halogenases to sample acute angles. To illustrate what I mean by this, in this image I'm depicting the native acute angle of the hydroxylase tau D. 
Now in this animation, I'm showing how the angle would change if we forced tau d to behave like a halogenase by sampling more obtuse angles. In other words, we use classical molecular dynamics to make hydroxylases behave like halogenases, and we also ran MD simulations to make halogenases behave like hydroxylases. We did this with the goal of probing how the actocyte would respond. After all, we would expect to see changes in the finely tuned interplay of the non-covalent interactions. Now, here, I'm showing the results of those calculations for the hydroxylases. And you can read this plot as here on the x-axis, we have the distance between the target hydrogen and the iron center. And here on the y-axis, we have the angle between the target hydrogen, the iron center, and the reactive oxygen. And what you can see is that if you take these two hydroxylases, either tau D or VOC, and you simulate them, allowing them to adopt the acute angles that you would expect to observe, you see that they have no problem falling in the expected range, which we show here with these dotted lines. However, if we run MD simulations and try to force them to adopt this obtuse angle that you would expect to see in a halogenase, you can see that the hydroxylase active sites actively resist adopting those angles. And you can actually see the exact opposite trend in the halogenases. Here we used BEST-D and WELL-05. You can see that they have no problem sampling the obtuse angles expected of a halogenase, but resist sampling the more acute angles that we would see in a hydroxylase. Now, after running classical MD, we next performed electronic structure calculations on the active sites of the enzymes to more accurately measure the strengths of all hydrogen bonds in either the acute or obtuse conformations. In this plot, you can see that when we force a hydroxylase to sample the obtuse angles of a halogenase, some of the hydrogen bonds remain intact. However, more importantly, some of them break, such as the hydrogen bond between aspartate 94 and the substrate taurine. You can see the breaking of this interaction in these two structures. In the first structure, you can see the salt bridge between ASP94 and taurine is intact. But when tau D is forced to sample halogenase angles, we can see that it breaks. These results suggest that AS94 could be a possible target for future mutagenesis studies, as mutating aspartate 94 would favor the obtuse positioning angle. And the results also show that there are specific amino acids and non-covalent interactions that control the acute positioning. Next, if we look at all the hydrogen bonds between the halogenase best and its substrate, we can see a similar trend. We can see the loss of several strong hydrogen bonds when switching to the non-native acute angles, such as the loss of the hydrogen bonds between histidine-134 and tryptophan-138, which we see here on the plot. For example, if we take a closer look at these interactions, we can see how the hydrogen bond between histidine-134 and the substrate breaks and the non-native acute conformation. In this first structure, which shows the obtuse conformation, we can see how the hydrogen bond is intact. However, in the acute conformation, we can see that the hydrogen bond is broken, freeing the substrate lysine to move to a more acute angle. Interestingly, this finding also agrees with an experimental study that shows that by mutating histidine-134 to an alanine, researchers were able to get a majority hydroxylated product in the halogenase best -D. We next looked at how differences in the substrate positioning angle would affect energetics. We specifically looked at the hydrogen atom transfer, or HAT step, as it's rate limiting for many non heme iron enzymes. And we found consistently across all our chosen systems that starting from an acute angle led to slightly lower barriers, which you can see here in these plots. For example, they show that the barrier for the HAT reaction, when started from an acute angle, is 23 kilocalories per mole and is 24 kilocalories per mole when started from an obtuse angle. Encouragingly, we also observe the same trend for the halogenases. For example, here we can see that for the halogenase BEST-D, the hydrogen atom transfer reaction that was initiated from an acute angle had a lower energetic barrier than the HAT reaction that was initiated 
from an obtuse angle. We also saw the same trend in the halogenase well 5 where the reaction that was initiated from an acute angle had a lower energetic barrier than the reaction that was initiated from the obtuse position. These observations make sense in the context of previous non-heme iron research, as it's known that halogenases have slower reaction kinetics and that their slower reactions may allow them to disfavor the hydroxyl rebound reaction in favor of halogenation in a process known as programmed inefficiency. Additionally, during our calculations we also observed the formation of complex hydrogen bonding networks around the iron hydroxyl. These networks involve succinate, and a residue from the first coordination sphere and are facilitated by the monodentate coordination of succinate, which is believed to be more common in halogenases. What was even more exciting was that we saw the same mechanism across two different halogenases, BESTI and Willow 5, suggesting that it may be a more general trend that will be observed in other halogenases. These hydrogen bonding networks present a significant energy contribution to preventing the hydroxyl rebound and would favor halogenation over hydroxylation. Now in summary, the goal of this project was to better understand the differences in substrate positioning between halogenases and hydroxylases. This is an important question because if we can engineer halogenases into hydroxylases and vice versa, we could greatly increase the scope of substrates that can be halogenated or hydroxylated. Second, we found that the active sites of halogenases and hydroxylases prohibit them from changing whether they can sample acute or obtuse angles. Hydroxylases seem to be designed to sample acute angles, while halogenases exclusively sample obtuse angles. Third, we found that specific interactions were responsible for maintaining the preference for acute angles in hydroxylases and the preference for obtuse angles in halogenases. And by identifying these specific interactions, we can propose potential targets for future mutagenesis studies. Fourth, we found that when comparing hydrogen atom transfer reactions that started from either an acute or obtuse angle, the obtuse angles led to higher reaction barriers. And fifth, we identified hydrogen bonding networks that could play an important role in preventing the hydroxyl rebound and thus favoring halogenation in the halogenases. Lastly, I just wanted to take a second to mention that our research is published and has been featured on the cover of ACS Catalysis. I mention this because I prepared this talk to be accessible to a general audience, so if you want more information about the methods and findings, check out our paper and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Last but not least, I would like to take a second to just thank everyone in the Kulik lab for their help and support. We're a very collaborative lab where both formal and informal conversations help mature a lot of the insights that I shared with you today. I would also like to thank my funding sources for making this project possible, and I'd like to give a special thanks to my amazing advisor, Dr. Kulik, for her help in bringing this project to life. Now, since this is a virtual conference venue, we won't have the traditional question and answer session, of course. However, feel free to reach out with any questions and I would be happy to talk more. You can reach me by email or find me on my website. Also, make sure to check out the Kulik Lab website if you'd like to find out more about our work or if you'd like to get in contact with my advisor for potential collaborations. Anyway, thank you again for listening and I hope I hear from you.